My name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm the director and co-founder of Real Abilities Film Festival. This is night number two. Thank you so much um, for joining us, all 92 of you at the moment. I, 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 lo I love watching the numbers. Um, it's uh, um, the only thing going up uh, these days um, uh, when, when you're looking at the stock market. Um, we are really excited about tonight's screening and to do this entire festival virtually. Um, for those of, a few of you who have joined Real Abilities before, you know a little bit about us. For those who have not, Real Abilities is the largest disability film festival in the country. And um, normally we run in multiple locations throughout, uh, throughout New York in order to be more accessible. Now we're running virtually, which makes us even more accessible than ever before. And, um, and, and that's, uh, that's some, this is an experiment that maybe we'll want to continue in the future. Um, of course, we hope everyone's doing well and staying healthy, and that's number one on our minds. And we felt that this year, especially this year, um, this is the time that people need to, uh, need to engage with one another. And the disability community specifically is one who is often pushed into the corner, and we don't want those voices from all these amazing films this year to be lost. So we really worked hard, and the amazing team here has put this festival together in uh, literally two weeks um, as a virtual format. And um, I I'm really excited, and the films um, this year are, are really going to, I think, give you an exciting week. And these conversations um, have so far been amazing. So we're going to jump into to tonight's conversation. But first, um, just to tell you a little bit how it works, because for those of you who participated last night, um, we've changed things around a little bit. We're still experimenting. So bear with us, of course. Um, but just to go through my notes, um, you can submit questions once again um, by typing in the chat box. Use that for questions. Um, I know you want to say hi to your friends, wave, text them offline, but, uh, but let's use that chat box mostly for questions. And we're going to go through that chat box um, after I ask our, our participants a few questions. Um, try to keep it to one question per audience member because there's a lot of questions. Even last night, we had a lot of questions that we have to sift through and only got to ask a few of them. Um, so not all questions will be chosen. If you cannot type and um, would like to ask your question verbally, um, raise, there's a raise hand option. Um, raise your hand and, um, and we will call on you and communicate with you directly and um, make sure to make your microphone turned on. Again, all of you are muted and we, we control that. Um, sorry. Um, of course, help us spread the word throughout the week. And I want to say one more thing before we go on to our panelists, and that is that um, our festival would be nothing with all, without all of our supporters and partners. And a lot of our partners are the ones doing the work on the ground. And um, I really want to highlight the partner page on uh, our festival website. Check them out. See all the people that are doing good things, especially these days. Um, I'm going to mention just, uh, just one tonight, um, the Reeves Foundation. And, um, and note that, uh, that they've been uh, wonderful supporters throughout the years and do a lot of great work. It's not, I'm not noting them specifically as work related to the film, but I think they are at the core of what our festival is about. And, and I actually honestly believe, and this transitions us into our program for tonight, honestly believe that the film that you hopefully saw tonight, it'll be available for you to finish in the next 24 hours, is at its core also essentially what our festival is about. I mean, I know the film was about Oliver Sacks, um, but I think it's really about seeing the human experience. And he was about seeing the human experience. And that is what Real Abilities tries to do by sharing these films. So it gives me great pleasure to, first of all, introduce the director of tonight's film. And this is, by the way, if you haven't yet, this is when you want to go to Speaker View, as am I. Um, I'm saying goodbye to your faces and clicking on the top of the screen to Speaker View. And um, in the, um, um, let you, I'll, g I'll give you a moment to prepare there and um, welcome um, really one of the most celebrated American documentary filmmakers, um, Rick Burns. Rick, thank you so much for being with us from your spooky cabin in the north. Exactly. <laughs> thank you, Isaac. And thank you, thank you to Real Abilities and all your colleagues for including us in this. I know that if, if Oliver around, were around, he would feel he would really had come home. So it's great, great to be here. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And and Rick is uh, normally an Upper West Sider, which means that this is all coming from his home as Real Abilities is run. Um, although now people can reach us nationally. Um, um, we're, we're run through the, J the Marlene Myers and JCC in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Um, so I feel like this film's having a little bit of a homecoming to right now. I feel that way too, Isaac. Thank you. Um, and I also would like to um, introduce Lowell Handler. You saw him in the film. Lowell, say hi. Hello, how are you? Lowell's a photographer and is featured in the film and um, was, um, of course, uh, acquainted with Oliver Sacks. Can I call him Oliver? I don't feel completely okay calling him Oliver and, and, and referring to him as Oliver, but um, there is so much to talk about in this film, so I do want to jump in. Um, I have a lot of questions and I want to leave much time for the audience as well, because I'm sure a lot of you have, uh, have questions out there too. But um, Rick, I'm going to start with you with, let's talk about the, the movie itself a little bit. How did this all start? Um, I, I feel like we get a little bit from the film that we know that he was coming towards the end of his life and um, wanted to tell his story as he did both uh, in his book. Um, but tell us a little bit about how this came about and how you went about making the film. Um, you know, in early January 2015, I got a call from um, a woman named Kate Edgar, who I didn't know. Um, who Kate is obviously in the film, um, Oliver's extraordinary editor and chief of staff and really the head of Oliver Inc. saying, um, Oliver is dying. He has this mortal diagnosis. He has about six months to live. We can come in and start filming. Um, and so my colleagues and I, you know, basically gave that no thought and plunged right in. And a few weeks later found ourselves in Oliver's um, apartment on Horatio Street in the village. And our first filming session lasted five days, 12 hours a day, um, Monday through Friday. Um, and although I knew Oliver's work quite well, I never met him before. And it was a remarkable experience to sort of dive in with an 81-year-old man who just finished a very candid memoir, which was not yet published, on the move, and then had gotten this, this, this fatal diagnosis. And so it was really like two minutes to midnight. Um, for someone who had had a very complicated, extraordinarily rich, um, very turbulent life in a quiet way, in many ways, as Lowell can attest, who was, wanted very much to make a statement about what it had meant and what his life meant. And so we ended up with 90 hours of footage with Oliver and his friends and family reading, talking, going to the botanical gardens later in the spring, going up to Beth Abraham in the Bronx. Um, and from that, along with 25 um, interviews with 25 people who knew him well, almost all of them after he died, and he didn't die. He died on August 30th, 2015, just after turning 82. And that was it. So it was a project with no R&D, no time to think in advance about it, but rather to be plunged in, which is quite different for someone um, like me who's used to doing historical documentaries, but it was really, um, it was it was a unique experience and a transforming one. Um, I'll, I'll also say that the that the film, which at, on its own is a wonderful film to tell a story. You choose a unique way of telling the story as far as as far as it's not going just like chronologically as you might have chosen for a history project, um, and and it really takes us around to understand different elements within his life and within his history um, and is built together beautifully. One of, the, one of the things I'll note is how you start off actually, um, um, I think at the beginning, letting us know a little bit about the world around him in the present and only then um, take us back um, to tell the story. Um, what were kind of some of the elements that you were looking to, to tell through, through this film? What were you looking to bring forth and put out there within this narrative? I'm sure you had a lot to work with and had to cut a lot. Um, so. We did. You know, I, th I think that at the heart of it, um, we, 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 took the, we took the film, you know, since where we found Oliver, which is to say, um, absorbed with two related but slightly distinct narratives. One was the story of a man who had just gotten a death sentence and had six months to live. How was he going to lead, lead out his life? What, how was he going to confront this circumstance which we had all confronted? The other was the story of his whole life, going back to the beginning. And of course, those two narratives, the deeper biographical and the more immediate experiential one, um, are, are deep, profoundly related and talk to each other. 
Um, but there was this constant sort of dialogue available between Oliver and the present and the story of, uh, you know, a little boy who was born in 1933 and grew up in an upper middle class Jewish household. Everybody was a doctor except one brother who was schizophrenic. Um, and in which there were many things unsaid, um, many things that were very difficult to speak about, including his own sexuality. Um, his mother abominated him, as she said, when he was 18 and came out. And so this person who created a, a personality of himself in the course of that biography as the avuncular, infinitely curious, infinitely empathetic Oliver Sacks was someone who was churning and roiling under the surface, was a much more extreme and sort of rocketing kind of character. Everyone who knew him well, Lowell, Lowell again can attest to this, can talk about how, you know, there was no in between. He was really, it was up or down, you know, you know, binge or, or you know, uh, purge. He was a person of, of massive um, contradictions and who, gave to his life, I think everyone who knew him, we certainly came to feel this found, the, the remarkable shape of someone who had to invent himself, as we all do, and create a shape for himself, as we all do, um, in the course of a life spent asking, by way of asking the question, who am I, he looked into who other people were. And he looked into people who most of us would think of as being neuroatypical which since he identified profoundly himself as neuroatypical, whatever the hell that means, um, he was someone who really felt in some sense by looking at this sort of extraordinary um, range of people and their inner experience. And that was Oliver's main focus. What does it feel like to be someone? He was interested in biology. He was interested in science. He was interested in chemistry and physics and periodic table. His main work was what does it feel like from the inside to be the person you are? And all of us are endowed, and animals too, with each of us a unique sentience as a being. He was a sentient thinking animal, he said, in a beautiful last essay. And he wanted to know what that felt like. And in so doing, to bridge the gap, which can sometimes seem very large, between those of us who seem very like each other, let alone people who may be experienced in themselves or feel that they are experienced by others as very different. And his, I think his whole work was a kind of like a narrative bringing together of what feels like difference into a remarkable commonality around that experience of consciousness and, and, and interior experience. And he was an amazing archaeologist of interiority, Temple Grandin, self-autistic, said that, you know, he was a sort of the Hubble Space Telescope of neurology and astronomer of the mind. And I think that as clever a comment as that is, I think there's a lot to that. He wanted to look deeply into other people's experience and create in his own writing, first using his own imagination and experience, a sense of who they were from the inside, shape it, give it narrative form, and then share it with the world. So it's a remarkable kind of bridging enterprise from the start. And that's what he invited us into and what we got to see during this remarkable last you know, four or five months of his life. And, and it's really amazing because actually when you bring in the film format to all of this, um, that's, that's part, of, part of why we do Real Abilities is to give people the opportunity, and this is I think part of what film really means, is we have an opportunity to understand other people and to, and to take that, that, that connection. I mean, somebody said in the film, biology and biography together. I think there's the words humanity there too. And we get to, the audience gets to experience that a little bit. And in some ways, some ways this film, you're doing what his life mission was by letting us experience a little bit of who he was and his humanity and his experience. And um, of course, uh, you even keep in there the jello scene, um, which uh, I'd love to talk more about, but, um, <laughs> but I think that that lends to giving us understanding who he was and trying to understand um, this, this, this person there and what's, what's inside of them. Exactly, and, that, and what an amazing thing, that's the, the mystery that's part of all of our lives the thing that each of us is most intimately familiar with, our own interior consciousness of being ourselves, is at the same time an enormous mystery even to ourselves. So where does it come from? How, what is this miracle that allows us not only to be biologically, you know, sort of electrochemically, you know, alive, but be aware of it? Where does that come from? 
And, you know, we're the only, we have unique access to it. You, you Isaac, have unique as, access to your Isaac. And my dog, Fiona, is the only per creature in the world who knows what she feels. And what a remarkable thing that we're all joined in this sort of, it's, we're bridged by the kind of the absolutely unique, some might call it isolating experience of interiority. And he was fascinated, obsessed with that from the very beginning. You know, a schizophrenic brother, someone who felt himself not anywhere near in control of his feelings, of who he was, what was his identity? What could he cop to as an identity? There were issues, whether it had to do with sexuality or his kind of extreme personality that he confronted from, from very, where would he fit in? Was there a place for Oliver to fit in? And so that question of like, you know, what it, who am I? What is this thing which is me? Is something which, which obsessed him from the beginning. And I think that, you know, for someone who, as Oliver did, was born a couple decades before C.P. Snow coined the phrase the two cultures to describe and in part to lament what seemed in the mid 20th century and went on seeming for a long time as a tremendous gulf between the discourse of science and the discourse of art. Oliver did not believe there was any difference between those two things at all. That essentially art was the science of human subjectivity that people like him trafficked equally in biography itself a form of art as you were saying Isaac and science, biology, neuroscience. He wanted to bring all those tools together, try to understand what is this thing, which when we wake up in the morning, the world gathers around us again, and suddenly we're here. It is the most magical thing. He never lost sight of that magic. He found it wondrous in everybody, in blades of grass, and mushrooms growing, in patients, in friends, in doctors, and that curiosity, kept him childlike with wonder, really into the very end. I mean, he was just, uh, one could see as he approached 82, that he was every bit as wonderstruck by the simple phenomenon of being alive, and therefore also, as he put it, you know, in his last essay, enormously grateful, frightened of death, but as someone who believed, did not believe in an afterlife, he understood that everything that has a beginning has an end, and that this very experience of, of self is itself contingent and arises from within finite circumstances which are intrinsically limited. And that therefore there is no outside to that and all the mystery you need is within inside that. And that for people you know, of any age, and perhaps particularly for those of us who are you know, getting long in the tooth and getting older, um, the grace with which he confronted I, one can't say fearless, but boldly and with curiosity and with a tremendous openness, this final chapter in all of our lives um, was, was one of the most moving things I've ever seen. And his, his friend, Lawrence Weschler, Ren Weschler, one of the people who got to know him earliest in the 1970s and 80s, he said, as he said in the film, it was a master class in God. How do you, how do you confront that with with you know all every aspect of your being alive and open to it. And so that was that that was what was very different for a person who's a historical documentary filmmaker because we had the quicksilver of someone alive coming really almost right down to the end. And that was remarkable. Like and then the tape ran out and the spool spun around and that was going to be part of his story and thus our story from the beginning. So it was like it was an experience unlike anything I've ever had. Amazing. Um, I want to bring Lola into this, but I, I just want to say that, I mean, I'm, I have the chills here um, talking about this, especially at this time, this week, oh my God. When, when to realize how precious life is mm -hmm. and, and where we are in this world right now and how, how delicate life is. I think mm -hmm. um, this, this, this is really hitting home in a very strong way. Um, Lowell, I want, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. Some of you might have recognized Lowell from the film. Um, um, tell us a little bit about how um, you knew Oliver and, um, and um, your relationship with him. Well, uh, Oliver and I met in 1986, right after uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat had become a bestseller. And we started working together. We collaborated on a bunch of uh, 
different uh, published pieces. In essence, I became his photographer for a couple of years, uh, a few years in the late 80s, and we remained friends until uh, he passed away. So I knew him for, uh, you know, almost 30 years. And uh, we traveled together uh, for long periods of time all over Europe and the States, the United States and Canada. And we collaborated on a bunch of uh, pieces together that I did the photographs for and that he did the uh, text. And, and seeing this film. Um... Oh, it's very moving. It's very moving because I've been thinking about him a lot lately. I've been thinking about Oliver a lot lately because this is a time I think where as a culture, we're really missing him because of what's going on uh, socially and politically and even scientifically about this virus. Um, I've been thinking about him a lot. And of course, I think about him more. I just saw the film Tonight again, Rick, uh, for the second time, because you know, I saw it the first time with you uh, at the New York Film Festival. And I picked up on things that I had missed during the first, you know, when you see a film for the second or third time, you miss little things after just seeing it once. And it really is, I mean, it's amazing. And I hope that it brings, uh, my hope is that it brings Oliver and his insights to even a wider audience. Uh, because he and his insights were very well known through his books uh, to many, many people, to many millions of people, but it's different seeing a film, as uh, Isaac said, it's different seeing it in a film. And as you said, he was a person of extremes, really. I think you said contradictions, but he extreme. wasn't really a person of contradictions. I agree, yeah. He was a person of extremes. And, uh, you know, it's incredible what he became in his life or who he became in his life. And when you said that he wants to get inside of people in their heads and their minds, really what he wanted to figure out in his lifetime was what it was like to be human. Um, I want to ask one more question before taking some questions from the audience. And I, I want to bring up the element of, which I think connects very much to what Real Abilities is as far as, as, far as, a, as a disability film festival, um, his appreciation of difference. He very much appreciated, and I think this is part of what he thrived on, of people who were different, things that were different, concepts that were different, approaches that were different. And appreciation of that, I think, lends itself very much to, to the world that, um, that we work in. Um, and I wanted to, to hear from you a little bit of your reflection on his approach to, to where that came from, really. Me? Um, both of you, actually. Oh, okay. Well, uh, he, he definitely... Uh, uh, tapped into that in a very big way. And I think a huge part of this, as Rick alluded to, was because of his own sense of insecurities and uh, I guess in some ways deficiencies uh, because he always considered himself different and as somebody who was an outsider and uh, somebody who had all kinds of quirks. And I have Tourette's syndrome. And uh, people would ask, you know, when we would, were out together traveling around, they would ask if, 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 if Dr. Sachs had Tourette syndrome, and of course he didn't, but he had all kinds of things that made him uh, different. And one of the, you know, when I was struggling a, a lot of the time with my own identity as somebody with Tourette syndrome, he would say to me, Lowell, if somebody asks, just tell them you're neuropsychologically different. And I'm saying, I laugh because I'm saying, oh shit, you know, like, as if that's going to explain everything, you know? <laughs> but that's what he would say to me. He would say, just tell somebody that you're neuropsychologically different and then just leave it at that, you know? <laughs> Interesting. Rick, what a... You know, I, I think that he had such a profound sense, you know, um, S.J. Perelman, the humorist, long dead from New Yorker, said, 
of himself in the third person. They broke the mold before they made him. I think Oliver felt that was very much true of him. He came from some kind of broken mold, but he felt profoundly that we all do, by which he meant that we're all different and that there is an irreducible uniqueness to who each of us are. And it's not as if that is not to make light of larger differences between people who have, you know, are, are, are on one range or another of anyone of another number of neuroatypical circumstances. But I think he felt really that our, the likeness we all share in our differences is what drew us together. And that he had a, um, a remarkably, I don't want to call it simple because he was so brilliant. But, you know, Pascal once said, you know, if you want to believe in God, it's not first you believe and then you pray. It's first you move your lips and pray, and then you believe. He believed very strongly that if you paid attention to the details of somebody, how they spoke, how they moved, how they looked, their tonality, and you yourself embodied them, you would be able to begin to interiorize moving your own lips, so to speak, how that person prayed from within. And there's a scene in the film where you watch him um, with an orangutan in this remarkably intimate dance where the orangutan is yawning and Oliver is yawning. And everyone who knew Oliver, Lowell, again, can attest to this. He was helpless, not, he could not stop himself from picking up on small, the smallest or most obvious gestures of someone and doing it as they did it. So he was kind of a chameleon um, impersonator of a certain point. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. He wanted to interiorize what it would probably feel like to be that being or that animal or that any living being. And that is really a way of saying there is something irreducibly unique and precious about each living organism. And he felt that, a bacterium, um, a, you know, a growth of moss, a frog, a cat, a dog, a human being of any particular um, sort of identity. And that one wanted to actually start from that irreducible uniqueness and then work out this and discover jubilantly yeah. everything that you share together in that difference. And you may think, well, you're just like, thank God I'm normal, someone might say. To which Oliver's profound response would be, or so you think. Well, I'll tell you what he said once when somebody said that, which was many years ago. Somebody said, uh, I can't be around anybody who's less than normal. And you know what his react what Oliver's reaction was? He said, This is someone who has the arrogance of good health. <laughs> you know, David Remnick at Oliver's memorial in the fall of 2015. In New York said a very moving thing. Everybody spoke so beautifully. And David said, you know, that there's comes a time in reading any one of um, Oliver Sacks' pieces of writing where the reader says to herself or himself, you know what? He, Oliver, is just as strange and just as unusual and just as different as the person he's writing about. And then Remnick said, and then there's another beat, and the reader says, and so am I. And that's the kind of the holy triangle Oliver was after. You know, another human being, himself, and his readership. He said, he said so beautifully, I had that special intercourse of writers and readers. And he wanted to bring together, as writers always do, a point of view, a subject, and the myriad interiorities taking it all in as they read, and to create during the temporality of the piece of writing, a form of communion, which is a form of coming together, a form of temporarily, not annulling the differences, but standing together within them. I really can't think of anybody else who as a writer, as a scientist, as a neurologist, and as a human being, was so peculiarly and passionately bent on creating that triangular union. And I think that that's, it's a remarkable achievement. Well put. I, I want to leave some time for some questions from our audience. So I'm going to, there's, there's a lot to talk about here, but I'm going to jump into some questions. Um, um, we have a very specific question here. I don't know if you'll know the answer, but um, what happened to Michael, his brother, and what was his relation to him um, as adults? This is coming from Shlomo Nessin. 
you know. Uh, well, uh, I believe Michael died, didn't he? Yes, he did. But Oliver would refer to him often, uh, even many years ago, long before he died, Oliver would refer to him as my crazy brother. And I remember asking him about it, and I remember talking to him about it, and he, I mean, I think it was painful, but again, he, I think they were very close at one point when they were younger. I think he went, they went long periods of time. I think he became quite psychotic later in his life. And I remember Oliver on numerous occasions referring to him somewhat uh, sarcastically, but at the same time, compassionately as my crazy brother. You know, I think my sense, you know, you knew him so much better, Lowell. Um, Oliver, my sense was similar to that, but also that, you know, he, they were very close. He was, I mean, he was probably closest to his mother and then, and then to, to Michael. Um, and, you know, I think that the relationship of identification of, and a of tremendous anxiety caused by his brother's schizophrenia, um, which took place, kind of came out in, in the, during the Second World War, um, and Michael was the closest of his three brothers in age to Oliver, who was the youngest. And the kind of, the, the sense of, of how deeply um, sorrowful and pained he was at that, and how he had to constantly titrate what he felt about his brother. You know, he was very angry, I think, with his parents. There were two extraordinarily gifted doctors, his mother even more brilliant and gifted than his brilliant general practitioner father, um, who hadn't really the faintest idea how to grapple with Michael's schizophrenia. And so there was a way in which his nephew, Jonathan Sachs, said, you know, Michael was sort of allowed to sort of like fall so far down the ravine. And I think there was a sense that of, of anguish and anger that Oliver felt on behalf of Michael. You know, who went on, was in and out of kind of like um, circumstances, lived, you know, in, in homes, lived in houses, died, I think, in the 1980s, um, but, you know, was very much present and very much part of the family, you know, throughout that whole thing. But it was scarring, obviously, to Michael and deeply scarring to Oliver and, and everyone else in his family. There's no question that. that I think it must have been incredibly difficult and very troubling. I think it was nightmarish. I think we managed to discover that the person who you shared most with and who you looked to most um, as a sibling suddenly was not, was not, was different than you thought he was. And that question he asked himself, which he said he posed to his own psychologist, psych psychoanalyst, um, Leonard Schengel, you know, am I psychotic too? I think that was the primal question Oliver had in the sense of kind of slippery um, uncertainty about the stability, his own inner stability was something which haunted Oliver pretty much his whole life. Maybe only in the last few years did he finally sort of did the RPMs of that anxiety begin to settle down. Although even at the end, I think the source of the extremeness you described well, came from someone who could ramp into a sense of self uncertainty yeah. remarkably volatilely, even at a very old Dr. Shangol died just a few weeks ago. There was an article in the New York Times, yeah. Um, we have here a question from Whitney for Rick. Um, in taking on this project, what surprised you in this journey and discovery? And how do you think this experience will or did influence your story-taking story filmmaking? Um, you know, It was, a, it was a journey of discovery from the very beginning. And it was that discovery, there was never a moment when we weren't filming Oliver and in a process of discovery at the same time. Um, I, early on, when I w first met Oliver, the first morning, it was February 9th, 2015, a Monday. I'd met him the week before, but the first time we really kind of rolled in with cameras blazing, I was really, like most people, I think, I think um, you know, if I, if I, the instinct that the person bef that one's confronting might have a severe narcissistic personality disorder is a little bit of a downer and off-putting. 
And I had a tremendous fear that Oliver might be such a person. Um, his self-absorption, which was evident, um, the fact that he did walk to the beat of a different drummer. And one tended to have to go with the flow of that temporality and other people's temporalities weren't really going to be very immediately accommodated. And I spent a couple of days kind of slightly wary and so glad that I was able to, we were able to, by circumstance, be with him for 60 hours. Like, that's not usually, you know, lol, we met you, we interviewed you for an hour and a half. It was wonderful. <laughs> he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 60 hours. Right, right. What happened was that deep immersion gave, gave people who, af, you know, after all, I and my colleagues just had come on at the very end, you know, um, a chance to get to know someone with a kind of, I don't want to call it intimacy, but an immediacy, immediacy that comes with, you know, you what, you can fake it for an hour, you can keep up a face, put on a good face or a bad face for, for a day. At the end of five days, you are who you are. And we all were that. And the simple trans, sort, of, sort of mutual transparency of human beings who spend time together had worked its wonders. And by the end of the week, I realized that I'd asked him a question on day two and he had seemed to ignore it. And I went like, aha, see that's that kind of thing. He's not even paying attention. Four days later on the last day, at the end of the day, as if he would just, I had just asked the question. He said, you know, Rick, you were just asking me the other moment about um, the mystery of autobiography and how we can never really entirely write our own lives because our lives are finished before we can entirely. And I looked at this man with amazement because nothing was lost. He right. was to answer it in his own way and his own time. But the fact that he hadn't responded in a way that I recognized as, you know, comporting with my sense of, you know, my own self image or normal social protocol really meant nothing. And Oliver didn't give a damn about it. Well, hold on to that over the course of time and come back to it. And the richness with which he then resumed, you realized, oh my God, if he'd answered it right away, what kind of, you know, sort of superficial answer might it have been? And that the really deep empathy and mutuality, which I was looking for and hoping for, and which we all are from every relationship, Oliver was ready to give in spades. He just allowed, had, to allow, had to allow him to do it in the only way he knew how. Well, that was really surprising. It was that aspect of the journey with Oliver, which went on for years, long after he died, as we kind of wrestled with the film and, and how to think about him and how to not, how to get it right, how to titrate how much of the extremeness was right so that we didn't just sort of create the impression of someone who was, you know, all jello and no, you know, <laughs> professional, um, you know, integrity, which he was not. He was both. He was remarkable combination of those extremes of tremendously shy and reserved and tremendously shockingly open. And that, to discover that Oliver had learned how to craft an identity for himself out of those kinds of extremes and find a way to share it, that was both the biggest surprise and the biggest joy of, of, of meeting him and working with him and working on the film. I want to take one last question from the audience for now. Um, and I'm going to add on to that a little bit. Um, Megan O'Hara asks a um, question about the filmmaking. How much was Oliver reading from his papers or how much did you interview him and actually have to ask him questions? I'll add on to that also that it seems that a lot of time you were just, you were covering his day-to-day -day life and sometimes in more of an interview with him. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like it was a talking head. It was either him reading or yeah. him in his atmosphere. I did notice, this is coming from me, I did notice that he was always wearing a blue button down. Yeah, uh, always. So I, I thought it all, I thought you shot this all in one day, actually. <laughs> so, I know what you mean. I, I know, right. The continuity was almost yeah. um, You know, the, the, sort of the gig was like, he'd finished this manuscript, sent it out to Knopf. Um, it was gonna be published in September of 2015. He gets this death sentence, and Kate Edgar calls up his publisher and says, you know, Oliver's not going to be around if he's not published before that. So they pulled up the pub date till, till 
April uh, 2015, and Oliver was there for the publication. And so he very much wanted to read from the manuscript. So the, the first part of the gig was like, Oliver's going to read. He's gonna, I would say two thirds of the filming was not Oliver reading. Um, and that what was wonderful was, from my point of view as a filmmaker, was that, you know, we could sometimes pull back to and rely on the concision and the beauty of written passages. But most of it was Oliver extemporaneously interrupting himself. He was never alone, always with a small circle of people. Um, and that circle changed continuously over those first five days. You know, his, his um, sister-in-law, Gay, from Australia, had been mother, married to his brother, Marcus, a doctor who had already died. And, you know, Carla, her daughter, his niece, and Billy Hayes, his, his partner, and, you know, uh, Dan Frank, his editor at Knopf, and this constantly rotating cast, always about three or four or five, always changing as the days went and as the day, days went by. And so you sort of, it was like interviewing somebody who had created their own special anthropological subgroup. These were Oliver's people, all of them different, some family, some friends, some Yolanda who had worked with him for a long time as a housekeeper, um, you know, Lowell, uh, a neuroscientist, um, Ren Weschler from The New Yorker, Robert Krulwich from NPR, um, you know, and so it was this remarkable kind of gallery of people constantly shifting, who constituted with Kate Edgar, you know, his closest family in a certain way, the rotating non-biological family which he had created around him. And so it was the natural environment in which to interview him. He was, you know, as a swimmer, that was the sea he was most comfortable mm -hmm. with. Um, and he could both be very open in that, also hide, you know, and find protection within it. So it was a remarkable little coral reef, human coral reef he had created for himself, which he invited us into. And we became temporarily, temporarily kind of fish swimming in and out of the, out of the, out of the reef too. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that itself is, you know, you know, it was kind of a little bit like a reading, kind of a little bit like an interview, kind of a little bit like cinema verite. And the moments that I feel most powerful that we were able to capture were moments where you could see Oliver and also sometimes people around him thinking and feeling, where he would suddenly look down and smile and off camera, Billy would say, what are you thinking about, Oliver? Mm -hmm. And he would say mischievously, oh, I daren't say. <laughs> That's where you then felt like, right, film is about image frames of light and sound, but you know what? Those mean nothing if somehow evoking and bringing to life something which is the inner feelings and workings of a human being. And so that, you know, we found our own way to navigate this little coral reef, which was Oliver's life. Um, and the only point of being there was really to be able to sense as best we could what the interiority of his life was, or of, I mean, Billy Hayes, photographer, writer, wonderful human being, um, and really a kind of a miracle in Oliver's life, since he had the most woebegone um, personal history of any human being um, I've ever met, um, until he met Billy late in life. Mm -hmm. Billy has Billy says beautiful things in the film, but he also suddenly he'll look away bashfully or have a smile on his face or he'll kind of like roll his eyes. And I've never felt so blessed by the abundance of human beings sharing their simple inwardness together. So it was like a kind of a family. I mean, it was an anthropology of a unique kind of non-biological family. Um, in which Oliver's felt at home. And I think that that's sort of what the story of the film is about, too. Um, you know, I'll say these films um, are a lot, like, they're so intense to make that even for months, I would say, for years after you've completed them, one is in a kind of... Uh, a need to sort of like purge oneself. And so it's a quasi post psychoanalytical moment for most filmmakers to have to talk breathlessly, voraciously, and at, 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 at ad nauseum to get them get the, to work through what these projects have meant to them. This is certainly as much as that as I've ever experienced.
Thank you. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, we learned the sign last, last night for um, uh, unmute, um, like that, um, little ASL. Um, before I ask you where this film is going, where else can people see the film? Um, just because uh, we're running out of the JCC in Manhattan, there's an interesting question here about, um, um, it, we, talk in, we hear about it in his early life that he had a Jewish upbringing. Um, does, was there any connection to Judaism later in life? Unmute Rick, please. Um, you know, <laughs> um, it's good friend John, friend Jonathan Miller. Um, we went to St. Paul's with, with, with another Jewish friend. They were the only three Jewish kids at St. Paul's in London. You know, Jonathan Miller said, you know, we were all three of us um, Jewish, but we didn't really, it wasn't really important. We were just Jewish. I think Oliver was a profound secular Jew. Um, he was deeply, you know, he's come a family that included Abba Ibn and scientists and doctors and I mean a massive, his parents had sprawling families on both sides, an infinite number of cousins. And I think that Oliver felt really profoundly um, sort of ritually and culturally um, Jewish. You know, he'd grown up near Golders Green um, in London. Um, and, and so that was, it was a profound part of who he was from the very beginning, even though he did not, you know, he, you know, was an orthodox. I mean, he, he was an atheist, he was a self-avowed atheist. A total atheist um, who absolutely reputed the, repudiated the orthodox religion of his parents, but at the same time found an enormous comfort in um, the culture and the habits and the um, intellectual passion and the family life and the food. One of the last pieces that he wrote was about the Sabbath. Yeah, about the Sabbath. The One of yeah. the last three pieces that he wrote at the very end of his life. And one of the last meals he had was from Russ and Daughters, a remarkable um, delicatessen on the Lower East Side. And it was really, you know, in that way too, as, an, as a profound atheist who had rejected the family's religion, he was someone who carried um, the sort of the cultural legacy within him in a, in a very profound way and was himself in some sense unmistakable, you know, from a, from a, a North London Jewish background. Where is Zabar's crowd just so you know? It's the Upper West Side, so. Exactly, that's right, that's right. Russ and Daughters, I don't know. Russ and Daughters um, back. I do want to give credit to Susan for that last question. Um, but going on to where can people find more about this film? What's the trajectory of this film? Where is it? You know, Isaac, we were so incredibly thrilled by, you know, it was, I have to tell you, it was the most brutally difficult film to make. Like I complain like that each time when I'm finished with the film, but this one was just really, it, it was very, very difficult not to screw it up. Um, and I was so glad when we finally pitched up on the shore about a year ago and realized it was going to come together. And then, you know, people began to see it. It was at Telluride and the New York Film Festival. And so it then has kind of blossomed on the festival circuit only, and, and you know, was fortunate enough to get a theatrical run, which was to have begun at the Film Forum in May, May, May 6, 2020. Um, so now, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, and the festivals are either gone or postponed or, God bless you, real abilities, you know, move, move to digital precincts. Um, and I, you know, I feel somehow really certain in my heart because of Lowell, um, because of Kate, because of Billy, because of Ren Weschler and Robert Crowich and all the people who spoke about the film, spoke in the film. And, and then of course, Oliver himself, there's just such a, there's a kind of a deep humanity about it that I think does speak to people. And I, you know, so I know it's gonna go on and continue to have whatever life festivals are able to enjoy as the pandemic you know, um, has its way with us and, and, we, and we try to manage it. And I, I feel certain that it's, it's going to be, you know, I certainly hope that it continues to, to reach and touch people and, and find out and eventually get, get to theaters because there is, it is a film. It's been wonderful to see it in theaters and it really seems to me it does, it does speak to people when they're together in that kind of shared space, as I hope it does as well to people when they're sitting in the privacy of their own homes or watching TV or, or watching these films. So, you know, it was a huge, huge privilege. And, and Lowell, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, you know, you are a, you know, 
Oliver loved you so deeply and you, as a photographer, as a writer, as a friend, um, you know, you brought so much. Our film is filled with your photographs, um, which I think- Great it, being a part of it, it was fantastic. And I think it's a really beautiful film. And I, I hope that, it, as I said at the outset, I hope that it brings uh, Oliver to many more people who didn't know about him before in the same way. Um, I just want, want to note, I'm sorry uh, to out you, but um, um, Billy Hayes is, is in the audience. I know commenting on uh, Billy, if you wanted to um, say anything, I know we can unmute your mic if you wanted to. Uh, to, to say anything here. I don't know if you have a mic, Billy. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes something else, but uh, um, Billy. Billy. Is... There he is. <laughs> All right. I, I will say for sure, Billy, you know, um, a, a, great, a great joy, a great aspect of the joy of the film was getting to know the people who knew Oliver and the, the ones that were closest in you know, the people who were with him when he died, and Billy. Oh, I just have to say, can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, Billy. What a joy to watch this film on my um, computer as I look up at 8th Avenue, which is actually in your film. Now, <laughs> now much emptier than those days when you filmed, but still beautiful. What, what a beautiful night. I just want to really thank um, the film festival for streaming this tonight. Yeah. I really feel connected and it's been wonderful. I, I, I sat down with a um, bottle of water and a um, box of Kleenex. I, I, I did shed a few tears and had to walk away, but it's, it's so gorgeous. And you both spoke so, so beautifully, Rick and Lowell, God. You both had me in tears. Billy, Billy thank you. So good to see you. Great to see you, Billy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, uh, this film hopefully will have a very long life and I think uh, a lot of people will connect to this film for years to come. Um, thank you so much um, to all three of you for sharing and being with us tonight. I said this last night. I mean, at these times, this is, last night was the first time I felt part of a community in weeks. And um, it's great to have that back. And I know we're not sitting next to um, uh, a lot of people, but uh, it's as close as we're gonna get these days. And it's important for us to, say, to stay safe. Um, our festival goes on for till April 6th. Um, we have an amazing program, many more films. Tomorrow night we're screening the film Kinetics, which is a British feature film um, made, um, authentically casted, made by and about a woman um, with Parkinson's who befriends a young man who does parkour. And they have kind of a surprising relationship, a beautiful film, and they'll be with us here for a conversation. Um, and we also have Comedy Night tomorrow night, The Real Abilities Comedy Night, which is an amazing experience with amazing comedians. So don't miss those and much, much more to come for the rest of the week. Um, Rick, Lil, Billy, thank you all so much. Thank you for this beautiful film. Everyone, Isaac, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Really, thank you for having us, Isaac, and to all your colleagues. Really God bless. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone. Have you a good too. night. Thanks, Yara. Thanks, Billy.